Good day everyone, this is Dr. Soper here, and today I'll be discussing the eighth topic in our series of lessons on information privacy and security, with today's topic focusing on wireless security. In order to provide a solid foundation from which to consider wireless security, I wanted to take a brief moment to review some of the primary concepts and ideas associated with wireless networking. To begin, a wireless network is a computer network that allows computing devices to communicate with each other without being connected via a physical communications medium, such as a networking cable. Modern wireless networks typically rely upon radio communications, which take place in the band of frequencies beyond infrared light in the electromagnetic spectrum. Other means of wireless signaling which rely upon higher energy frequencies within the electromagnetic spectrum are, of course, also possible. Within the broader framework of network communications, wireless networks are implemented at the physical layer, that is, layer 1 of the OSI reference model. Wireless networks are established using wireless access points, or WAPs. A wireless access point is a hardware device that allows properly equipped computing devices to connect wirelessly to a network. WAPs are typically physically connected to a wired network via a network router. One of the primary components of a wireless access point is a radio transceiver which is a device that allows for both the transmission and reception of radio signals. Client devices wishing to join a wireless network also have a transceiver, and in this way, two-way wireless communication between a client and a WAP becomes possible. Wireless access points commonly use the Wi-Fi set of communication standards, which are alternatively known as the IEEE 802.11 protocol suite. As a brief aside, many people believe that the term Wi-Fi emerged naturally as a shortened version of the term wireless fidelity. This belief is incorrect. The term Wi-Fi was actually invented by a brand consulting firm whose goal was to create a more marketable name for wireless technologies than IEEE 802.11. Finally, each wireless access point is identified using something known as a Service Set Identifier, or SSID. An SSID is a textual string between 1 and 32 characters in length that is intended to provide a human-readable way of uniquely identifying a wireless network. In this way, a human user can easily identify the wireless network to which she wishes to connect. Wireless networks have become commoner and commoner in the past several years, and this has given rise to an interesting social phenomenon, wherein neighbors anonymously communicate with each other using the SSIDs of their wireless networks. Consider, for example, this screenshot of the SSIDs available in one neighborhood. The names of the wireless networks clearly indicate an interesting squabble among neighbors. Wireless networks are advantageous in many different ways, and one good way of understanding the advantages that wireless networks provide is to divide them into two groups, advantages for network users and advantages for network providers. For network users, wireless networks provide both convenience and mobility. Wireless networks are often more convenient to users than wired networks because they allow a user to connect to a network without needing to attach a network cable to her computing device, and without needing to specify any cumbersome network configuration settings, such as IP addresses, subnet masks, gateways, DNS servers, and so forth. Wireless networks also provide users with mobility, 
rather than being forced to stay in one physical location as with a wired network users of wireless networks are free to roam to any location in the world which provides wireless access and can still be connected to the network wireless networks also offer many advantages for network providers first with wireless networks a network provider needs to run much less network cable than would be necessary if it used an exclusively wired network of the same capacity. This concept also extends into mobile telephony. Developed countries, for example, spent more than a century laying millions of kilometers of telephone wires. In the modern era, Developing and emerging countries can simply deploy wireless telephone networks in order to allow their citizens to communicate, thus leapfrogging over years of developmental challenges. Further, wireless networks are advantageous to providers because they provide both fewer points of failure and fewer points of attack. This allows a network provider to focus its efforts on protecting and maintaining a smaller number of network access points. When considered together, all of these advantages translate into lower installation and maintenance costs for network providers. In addition to proper authentication credentials, a person who wishes to use a wireless network must have a wireless network interface card, or NIC, which supports the communications protocol that is being used by the wireless network. In the early days of computer networking, NICs were often separate devices that had to be installed into a computer's expansion slot. As networking has matured, however, network interface cards have become standard components that are now often a permanent part of a computing device's primary circuitry. Note that each NIC has a media access control or MAC address which theoretically provides a means through which the network interface card can be uniquely identified. The ability of each computing device to be uniquely identifiable and addressable is essential in computer networking, including wireless networking. Most modern wireless networks rely upon the IEEE 802.11 suite of communications protocols. The 802.11 protocol suite is a family of related communications protocols that provide detailed specifications for implementing local area wireless computer networks. Examples of 802.11 based wireless protocols include 802.11a, 802.11b, 802.11g, 802.11n, 802.11ad, and so forth. The usable range of 802.11 wireless networks varies widely from approximately 30 meters to approximately 500 meters, depending upon the local environmental conditions and the specific protocol being used. With respect to the latter, different versions of the 802.11 standard use different frequencies within the radio spectrum. Some of these frequencies are able to penetrate obstacles such as walls and furniture better than others, thus improving their effective range. Wireless data are transmitted in blocks called wireless data frames. Each wireless data frame is composed of three major parts, the frame header, the frame payload, and the frame check sequence. The frame header contains many different attributes that are necessary in order to make wireless networking practical in a multi-user environment. First among these is the frame type, which might be a standard data frame or some other sort of frame such as a beacon frame, an authentication frame, an association frame, and so forth. The second attribute in the frame header indicates the direction of the frame that is, whether the frame is being sent from a client to the wireless access point or from the wireless access point to a client. 
The third part of the frame header handles fragmentation and order control. Since wireless messages are subdivided into frames, it is necessary to track the order and sequencing of each frame within a message. The fourth part of the header is an encryption bit, which indicates whether the frame uses wired equivalent privacy or WEP based encryption. Finally, the header contains the MAC addresses of the sender and receiver so that all of the wireless devices within range can determine whether the frame is meant for them. After the frame header, the next major part of the wireless data frame is the frame payload. The payload is simply the actual data that is being communicated between the client and the wireless access point for this frame. Wi-Fi data frames contain between 0 and 2,304 bytes of payload data. Finally, the third major part of the wireless data frame is the frame check sequence, which is used to verify the integrity of the frame. Put another way, the frame check sequence is used to ensure that the data frame was not modified or corrupted while in transit between the client and the wireless access point. The check sequence for a data frame is commonly some variety of cyclic redundancy check or CRC value. In addition to standard wireless data frames, the Wi-Fi protocol also supports protected management frames. A protected management frame is a special type of wireless data frame which contains information that is intended to facilitate the management and control of wireless connections between client devices and wireless access points. Many different types of management frames have been defined, but from a security perspective, there are three types of management frames that are of paramount importance. First among these are beacon frames. A beacon frame is a data frame that is periodically transmitted by a wireless access point in order to announce the presence of the wireless network to clients that are within range. Among other information, beacon frames often include the SSID of the wireless access point. The next important types of Wi-Fi management frames are authentication and deauthentication frames. These frames are respectively used when a client wishes to authenticate itself to a wireless access point or when a client wishes to close an existing authenticated session. Finally, the Wi-Fi standard defines association and disassociation request frames. An association request frame is sent from a client to a wireless access point when it wishes to establish a connection to the network. Among other information, association request frames contain the MAC address of the client's wireless network interface card. If the wireless access point accepts the association request, it will allocate resources for the requesting client and will assign the client an association ID. If either the client or the wireless access point wishes to terminate an existing association, it will send a disassociation request frame to the other party. Although wireless networks have many advantages for both network users and network providers, it is important to realize that using wireless networks can potentially create many security vulnerabilities. First, no physical boundary exists between a malicious party and the data that are being transmitted over a wireless network. Put another way, a wired network provides an additional layer of protection that a wireless network does not provide, insofar as eavesdropping on a wired network requires physical access to network infrastructure components such as routers or network cables. Another vulnerability associated with wireless networks is that they often create an unknown boundary for the network. In a wired network, networking and security personnel can know precisely where the network ends. This is not usually possible with a wireless network because clients often establish or drop connections to a wireless network on an ad hoc basis. 
What's more, these clients can further complicate and obscure the network boundary by using network extenders or by enabling internet connection sharing through which other computing devices are able to connect to the wireless network by piggybacking on an existing client connection. In general, the nebulous and unprotected nature of wireless networks introduces threats to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data traveling over those networks that would not be present if the same data were traveling over a wired network. In wireless networking, the most substantial threats to information security emerge in the context of unsecured wireless networks. Unencrypted wireless data frames can be easily sniffed and analyzed using free software by anyone within range of the wireless network. Unsecured wireless networks are, in fact, such appealing targets that the search for and documentation of such networks has become a widespread activity among malicious parties. Searching for and marking unsecured wireless networks is known as war driving and war chalking. War drivers use a special set of symbols to mark streets and sidewalks so that other knowledgeable parties can take advantage of the wireless networks in the area. Aside from some free software, all that a malicious party needs in order to hijack an unprotected wireless association is the SSID of the wireless access point and the MAC address of an established client. After obtaining these two pieces of information, the malicious party simply needs to change the MAC address of her wireless network interface card to match the MAC address of the legitimate client and begin broadcasting data frames to the SSID of the wireless access point as if she were the legitimate client. Although many people believe that MAC addresses are permanent immutable values that are forever linked to one specific hardware device, in reality this is not true. The MAC address of most network interface cards can be easily changed using free software in a process known as MAC spoofing. Further, the MAC address of an existing client itself can be easily acquired using wireless packet sniffing software, which means that the SSID is the only remaining piece of information that a malicious party needs in order to hijack a wireless association. The way in which a malicious party obtains the SSID depends upon the way in which the wireless access point is configured. Two different options exist with respect to how a wireless access point handles its SSID. In the first approach, the wireless access point simply broadcasts its SSID as part of its beacon frames. In this case, a malicious party only needs to wait until the wireless access point announces its presence using a beacon frame in order to obtain the SSID. In the second approach, the wireless access point hides its SSID in a process known as SSID cloaking. From a security perspective, the reasoning behind SSID cloaking holds that the security of a wireless network can be increased by requiring a client to know the SSID in advance prior to joining the network. In practice, however, this is simply a form of security through obscurity, which is widely acknowledged to be a poor strategy for securing information assets. When SSID cloaking is enabled, the wireless access point does not broadcast its SSID. Instead, all legitimate clients in the area must broadcast the SSID in their data frames so that the wireless access point knows that those data frames are intended for it. Even with SSID cloaking enabled, a malicious party can therefore easily obtain the SSID simply by using a wireless packet sniffer and can hence easily hijack an established unencrypted wireless association. 
The security dangers associated with the wireless transmission of data have been known since the dawn of the age of wireless communications. In an effort to provide a layer of protection to Wi-Fi networks, Wired Equivalent Privacy, or WEP, was released for the 802.11 protocols in 1997 and was formally accepted in 1999. WEP was intended to provide wireless communications with a level of privacy similar to that provided by wired communications. A number of weaknesses have been identified in WEP, with the first weaknesses being identified less than two years after its formal acceptance. WEP, for example, uses a shared static key, meaning that the same key sequence might be used for multiple data frames belonging to the same message. Further, WEP uses a short encryption key comprised of as few as 40 bits. A 40-bit key can be easily cracked with modern computers using brute force techniques. Third, WEP implemented a weak encryption model based upon the RC4 algorithm. In the WEP encryption model, if a malicious party is able to guess the decrypted value of any single frame, then the key sequence used to encrypt that frame can be recovered. Since WEP reuses the same key sequence over and over, this means that other data frames can be cracked as well. Fourth, WEP used an unencrypted integrity check value that was generated from a well-known algorithm. A malicious party could thus send modified data frames with appropriate check values that would appear to be legitimate. Finally, WEP had no formal mechanism for authentication. Without authentication, a malicious party could gain access to the network if she was able to obtain a correct SSID and MAC address. With all of these weaknesses, WEP can now be cracked using free software in just a few minutes. In light of all of the problems that were identified with wired equivalent privacy, the IEEE recognized a need for an improved way of protecting wireless data while they were in transit between a client and a wireless access point. To this end, Wi-Fi Protected Access, or WPA, and later Wi-Fi Protected Access version 2, or WPA2, were developed as a replacement for the flawed Wired Equivalent Privacy Standard. Here I will address the features and capabilities of WPA2 since it has superseded the WPA standard. Broadly speaking, Wi-Fi Protected Access was designed to improve wireless security by specifically addressing the problems that had been identified with the Wired Equivalent Privacy Standard. First, WPA2 uses a dynamic encryption key as opposed to the static encryption key which was used with WEP. This allows the encryption key to be changed for each data frame involved in a wireless message. Second, WPA2 includes real authentication. In practice, most WPA2 enabled wireless networks use password-based authentication, but the standard also allows for other authentication mechanisms such as tokens, certificates, and so forth. Third, WPA2 uses strong encryption with a long encryption key. The standard now supports AES encryption with a 256-bit key. Fourth, WPA2 uses improved cryptographic integrity protection for data frames. Specifically, the standard supports 64-bit encrypted data integrity values. Finally, WPA2 implements a much improved method of initiating sessions which relies on a four-way handshaking operation. Together, all of these characteristics make WPA2 wireless networks much more secure than WEP-protected wireless networks. Despite the many security improvements that were incorporated into the Wi-Fi Protected Access Standard, there remain several known ways in which WPA2-protected wireless networks can be attacked. 
First among these is a man-in-the-middle attack. To implement this attack, a malicious party first waits by a wireless access point, or WAP, for a legitimate user to initiate an association with the WAP. When an association is established, the malicious party captures the MAC addresses of the legitimate user and the wireless access point. Continuing the attack, the malicious party then changes his MAC address to match the MAC address of the wireless access point and sends a disassociate request to the legitimate user. Believing that the malicious party is the wireless access point, the legitimate user terminates her association. The real wireless access point, of course, is not aware of this. Meanwhile, the malicious party changes his MAC address once more, this time adopting the legitimate user's MAC address. The malicious party is then able to continue the legitimate user's authenticated session with the wireless access point. The second way in which Wi-Fi protected access networks can be compromised is through an authentication attack in which SSID masquerading is used to obtain legitimate authentication credentials. To begin the attack, a malicious party acquires the SSID of a legitimate wireless access point. The malicious party then establishes his own wireless access point using the same SSID as the legitimate access point, thus allowing the malicious party to masquerade as the legitimate access point. When a legitimate user attempts to authenticate herself to the real wireless access point, she unknowingly sends her authentication credentials to the malicious access point. The malicious party can then use the legitimate user's credentials to access the network via the real wireless access point. The third way in which a Wi-Fi protected access network can be compromised is through a password attack. WPA and WPA2 allow for password-based authentication. So standard password cracking approaches, such as a dictionary attack or a brute force attack, can be used in an effort to gain access to the protected network. If the password for the wireless network is short or easy to guess, then a password attack might be very effective. To ensure that a wireless network is as secure as possible, network administrators should follow several key guidelines. First, and most importantly, the wireless network must be encrypted. For this purpose, it is critical to use WPA2-based encryption rather than WEP-based encryption, since WEP encryption is severely flawed and can be cracked with free software in just a few minutes. Second, a long password should be used for network authentication. Using a long password may be slightly inconvenient for users, but it will help to foil any password cracking attacks. Third, network administrators should consider the implications of open versus closed SSID broadcasting. Using SSID cloaking is simply a form of security through obscurity, which is known to be a poor strategy for securing information assets. Fourth, a network administrator can consider specifying a list of allowable client MAC addresses. Devices without a proper MAC address would therefore be disallowed from joining the network, even if they present proper authentication credentials. This method is not foolproof, however, since MAC addresses can be easily spoofed by a properly equipped malicious party. Finally, it is important to remember that the benefits of wireless networking come with a price. As opposed to data that are traveling over a wired network, wireless data are much more exposed. Even if wireless data are encrypted, the absence of a requirement to physically wiretap the network brings malicious parties one step closer to gaining access to sensitive data. Well, my friends, Thus ends our overview of wireless security. I hope that you learned something interesting in this lesson, 
and until next time have a great day